Hey, I have a question. Are you guys in a good mood? Because we're, we're gonna laugh today a little bit, okay? And I just, if I'm the only one laughing, that's weird, but if we all laugh, it's fun, okay? Perfect, okay, great start. So last week, Pastor Reed started a series on mental health called Sound Mind, and he talked about anxiety. And so if you missed that last week, um, that's a very common struggle in America. I would highly recommend you getting on Facebook or YouTube and watching that sermon. Super helpful, super, super good, okay? What I'm starting today in the middle of this Sound Mind series is we're gonna spend a few weeks talking about stress and then Pastor Reed's gonna finish it talking with depression. And so again, all stuff that kind of deals with this mental health stuff, stuff that we need to talk about more. Um, And so make sure you stay caught up. That being said, um, we're talking about stress today. And this is something that every single person in the room We have to deal with it. Life can be stressful. Like your stress level right now may be low, your stress level may be high or somewhere in between, but stress is kind of a normal part of life. So what is it? How do we deal with it? Et cetera, right? First off, the definition. The World Health Organization defines stress as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult situation. So stress is an internal struggle usually due to an external circumstance or situation, relationship, et cetera, right? So something out there is causing problems with me in here, and that's what stress is. Not only that, but again, stress can range in severity, and the more severe stress gets, it tends to manifest itself in your body. So it can manifest itself in your body, your mind, and your mood, and your behavior. These next couple slides aren't in your notes, but just kind of FYI, if you Google this, this is some of the stuff you're gonna see. Um, When you have stress in your body, it can manifest itself with stuff like headaches or muscle tension or pain, chest pain, fatigue, uh, upset stomach, sleep problems, a weaker immune system so you might get sick easier or more often. Um, Not all these necessarily, and this isn't the whole list, but this is some ways stress might manifest itself in your body. Here's how it could look in your mind and your mood. Anxiety, restlessness, lack of motivation or focus, memory problems, feeling overwhelmed, grumpiness or anger, sadness or depression. Um, And then in your behavior, it can affect you by leading you to overeat or undereat. You can have anger outburst. You can misuse drug or alcohol. You can avoid friends or stay at home. Some of you didn't realize you were stressed until I read all that list and now you're stressed that you might be stressed, right? So like, obviously, if you're stressed, you're not gonna display every single one of these, but as stress gets more severe, these are some things that might happen in your heart, mind, soul, in your body, in your behavior, right? So with that being said, though, if stress is something that's messing with me internally because of these outward uh, circumstances, what are the major outward circumstances that can cause stress in my life? Uh, The American Psychological Association says that there are at least four major causes of stress. Relationships, which we're talking about today, time and busyness, work and money. And Pastor Reed's gonna work through the other three over the next few weeks, but today we're gonna zero in on relationships. And when I say relationships, I really mean those closest to you. So like your wife or your spouse, your kids, your extended family, your friends, your small group, your church, the person sitting beside you, like like stress in in those who are closest to you, okay? Um, That being said though, We talk about how stress kind of ranges and there's reasons why your relationships can cause stress. And as I was thinking about this and kind of talking about it with other people and just reflecting on my own life, uh, there's at least three reasons why there's a lot of stress in relationships. Uh, And the first one is there's this idea of expectation, right? Like you expect something, it's unmet or unfulfilled and it tends to cause at least annoyance, but it can lead to stress. So it's everything from like, I expected my kids to pick up after themselves after their snack. I don't know why I expected that, but I did. It did not happen. And the result was stress, frustration. Anybody else? Y'all with me on that one? No? All right. You're ki- Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So it, it can even be like, I expected them to know my intentions, right? Like there was a problem. There's a lack of, uh, there's a miss, miss, you know, expectations. I assumed that they would know my intentions that caused problems. Uh, Some of us expected to leave the house at a certain time this morning, right? Like 
cause some stress, right? Most of the, the time in my closest relationships when there's unmet expectations, when I really think about it, there, it's not stuff that is gonna matter in five, 10, 15 years. It's my kids, like they left their clothes on the floor next to the hamper instead of just putting it in the hamper, right? That doesn't matter. It's super annoying. That stuff added up can cause stress, but a lot of times it's these unmet expectations. It's simple things. Also though, in your closest relationships, there can be some really deep unfilled expectations and that really cause deep hurt and deep problems like, I expect you to be faithful. I expected you to um, be there for me when I struggled. I expected you to stop this like we talked about or start this like we talked about, right? Like, even though a lot of our problems tend to be silly, they really can get deep really fast. And the deeper it is and the more severe your problems are, that's a lot of times when those, those symptoms of stress can really begin to manifest themselves as the stress gets deeper and more consistent and more hurtful, okay? So you have this whole issue of unmet expectations. You expected something. And again, think about all those relationships. Like this is a very common thing. But you expected this and it didn't happen. And because there was unmet expectation, problems arise, stress arises, there are a result. Sometimes um, it's not just unmet expectations. It's that there was things expected of you that you didn't even know you were supposed to do, right? Where's my husband's at? You ready? Yeah. Have my back. Have my back. All right. There, it's not just unmet. It's, it's unknown expectations, which leads us into number two, this whole deal of communication, like there's stress in your closest relationship because there's a lack of communication. And what I found is communication has two really important parts. One is articulating and one is listening. And so on this one, you're all, we're all over the map in this room. There's some people in here that just struggle to really share their thoughts, feelings, emotions, intentions, plans. Like you just have, a, you don't really think about that I need to share that or you don't know how to share those things. Some of you though, Bless you, you're, you're the most open book and like even your checker out or at Walmart is like, I don't need to know all these things, right? Like this is a 30 second transaction. I don't need to know about your marriage. Like you can just say hi, right? Like, so like we range like either struggling to really articulate or like we're oversharing um, and that can be a problem. Sometimes somebody's articulating the other one's just not listening, right? We, all the wives are like, yeah, nobody listens. All right. I'm gonna share three things, right? Because if you're gonna communicate, you have to articulate and you have to listen. But it's funny because it's, it's a struggle for us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share three kind of memes that I stole from the internet. Could have got a hundred of them, all right? You can replace husband or wife with child, mom, coworker, friend, hopefully not pastor, but maybe pastor, okay? Uh, watch this, you ready? My wife says, I only have two faults. I don't listen, something else. <laughs> That's right. Come on. All right. Next one. Husbands are the best people to share your secrets with. They'll never tell anyone because they aren't even listening. <laughs> and lastly, my husband just stopped and said, you aren't even listening, were you? I thought, That's a pretty weird way to start a conversation. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, but like, it's kind of painfully true sometimes, right? Like, like when there's a lack of communication or miscommunication, especially in your closest relationships, it can be annoying, but it can really create a lot of stress and it can create a lot of problems that you have to work through, all right? So um, it's not just the unmet expectations. It's not just a lack of communication. There's also a third one, and it's this idea of magnification, magnification. And what I mean by that is you focus on something in a relationship, and when you focus on things like gratitude and encouragement, it tends to be a much healthier relationship. But you can also zero in and focus on every person's faults and issues and shortcomings, and that tends to create a lot of negativity, all right? So watch this. You have a choice of what you focus on. And the more you focus on something, the bigger that thing tends to be. So if you're focusing on something positive, positivity can grow. If you're focusing on something negative, negativity tends to grow. But here's the, cho the truth. You can choose what you want to magnify, right? Now, from here, who, who y'all want me to pick on? Banks? From here, Banks looks good, doesn't he? Looks great. Looks, but watch this. Watch what if I had closer. What's up, Banks? Hey, I can see you a little clearly now. All right. And watch this. Oh, man. 
<laughs> no, for real though, right? Like I can choose what I wanna magnify. And the more I zero in on something, man, it, it becomes more clear. And the truth is, what you look for, you tend to find. And so all your closest relationships have one thing in common. You know what it is? It's with a bunch of sinners, which means if you're looking for something wrong, you're gonna find it. If you're looking for something negative, you're gonna find it. If you're looking for what they can't do, you're gonna find it. If you're looking for where they're weak or where they struggle, you're gonna find it. And if that's your focus, if that's what you focus on, that's gonna magnify and get bigger to where that's all you're thinking about. My husband never does this. He always does this. You always respond that way. My friend, I'm always there for my friend. My friend never has my back. They never check on me. I'm always checking in on them. Maybe, but like I'm talking about where is your focus? Like what are you focusing on? What are you zeroing in on? Because the more you focus on something, the more it consumes you, the more that's all you can see, the more it grows in your heart, mind, and soul. And as you talk about relationships and stress, as you zero in on everybody else, it can be a very positive thing or it can be a very negative thing. Now, here is a healthier way, in my opinion. Rather than using your magnifying glass and focusing on everybody else's faults, what you really need to do is this right here. All right? Now, oh, there we go. All right. So, what I'm about to say is important. But I know that there's people in this room right now that can hear my voice. And like, some of the relationships close to you, it's actually, it's very severely negative, like there's abuse or there's neglect or there's abandonment or there's these really serious offenses that we're talking about. If that's you, we might need a different set of principles. What I'm talking about is generally across the board with the majority of your relationships, what would be better than focusing on all of their faults and issues and problems is if you would take a hard look in the mirror and really examine your own heart. Because what I found is this, your relationships tend to get healthier as you get healthier. And you don't get healthier when you're focused on everybody else's stuff. In fact, what I found is that the more I focus on everybody else's faults and issues, the more I can give myself a pass because I'm not as bad as that person. Look at them. When I was a pastor in Odessa, uh, we did a lot of marriage counseling, and I think I have PTSD from it, okay? Um, but the reality is we would sit with these couples and man, the wife could articulate everything the husband did wrong, everything that he wasn't, everything that he should be. The husband could articulate the exact same thing in the wife. And I'm not even saying they were wrong, but I'm saying all they could see is what the other person has done right, or done wrong. And almost like giving themselves a pass, I'm not as bad as them, look at what they've done. It never got to health, it never got to positivity because the focus was always magnifying what the other person did wrong and never really looking in the mirror and taking a humble ownership of their own heart, mind, and soul. And the more that you're focused on everybody else's faults, I promise you, you're gonna justify yourself and you're gonna be unhealthy. The healthier you can get, the healthier your heart can be, the healthier your relationships tend to be. Here's what I tell my kids all the time. I say, listen, can you control their response? Can you control their reaction, their emotions, their decisions? You can't control somebody else, but you absolutely have the ability to control those things in yourself. And the more that you can take a humble look at yourself and get yourself in order, the healthier you, the relationships around you tend to be because you tend to be a healthier person. And so listen, with my wife and my kids, they're the closest to me. I can tell you where they fall short. I can tell you what they're good and bad at. And I can choose to magnify their fault if I want. But the healthier way would be for me to humbly take ownership of myself and to actually process that so that I can actually serve and bless and benefit them and help them along the way. So that's a good idea. But my question is, what does the Bible actually say? Because I can give you a bunch of opinions, but I want us to look at the word and say, God, would you form me? Here's what the Bible says. Psalm 139 says, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. And if you're familiar with this psalm, it's incredibly convicting. God says, uh, he says, God knows everything about me. He knows when I sit down. He knows when I stand up. He knows my thoughts from afar. He knows my words before I ever say them. Um, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Which what the psalmist is saying is, God has looked at us with this. God looks at you and he knows you perfectly. He knows what you're really good at. He knows your giftings. He knows your personality. He also knows your flaws and your shortcomings and those evil desires and motivations. He knows things that you won't admit to anybody else. He knows you better than you know you because he's looked at you with this and he sees everything about you. And that can either be this. That can either be incredibly terrifying or it can be incredibly humbling. 
And knowing that God is who he says he is, that he's the kind of God who really is the way the Bible says, we understand that when God looks at us and he sees us, man, God has a different heart than we tend to have. When God looks at us, he looks at us with this magnifying glass. He looks down to our depths, and his response is that he moves toward us in compassion and love. And we know this is true because the whole message of the gospel is that God knows we're sinners. God doesn't, God doesn't pretend we are better than we are. The Bible says even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us, which means even while we are in our sin, God knows that we're in our sin, and so he himself steps out of heaven and puts on flesh. Right, He knows what he's getting himself into. And then he actually lives a sinless life. He dies on the cross in my place for my sin, not his. He's buried, he rises the third day. 40 days later, he ascends into heaven and then one day he will return again. Like This gospel message is centered around the fact that we are sinners and we're broken and we need this God to rescue us. And so God, when he sees us as broken, he doesn't push away from us, he moves toward us in compassion and love. It's incredible, it's the gospel, it really is grace, it's the best news in the world. But here's what happens. A lot of times in West Texas, we kind of dumb Christianity down and it's like Christianity is about praying a prayer and then I attend church and just try to be a good person. I might get baptized, right? Like biblically though, like being a Christian says, I'm going to follow Jesus. Like biblically Christianity says, I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, so I'm placing all my trust and faith in the Jesus who the Bible says did all this stuff for us. So we're putting our faith in Jesus, we're receiving his forgiveness, he's giving us his spirit so that we might live for him. Like the idea of Christianity is that you actually follow and obey Jesus, you follow and obey God. And so not only are we following him, but as we walk with him and we walk in tune with his spirit, he tends to change us from the inside out so that we begin to look more like compassion and love and not like the stuff that we tend to look like so easily. So as God changes and forms us as we walk with him, we then begin want our life to look like God's. We then want our relationships to be marked by compassion and love which means we actually want our, our life and our relationship to be marked by what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to the way Paul says this in Galatians 5. This whole chapter is incredibly helpful. It's been shaping my life for the last 20 years. Look what he says, though. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So this is anything that tends to come natural that's not of God. It can be anything, and he actually lists a bunch of stuff. But walk by the Spirit, I think that's another word for being a Christian, I think God's heart is we put our faith in him, he gives us his spirit, and the normal Christian life is that we walk with God in obedience to God. We walk out our faith as we're in tune with the spirit, and when God says yes, we go, when he says no, we don't, and like we're in tune with the spirit, and when he nudges, we respond. Like That's the call of our faith. This right here should be normal Christianity. We're walking close to the spirit of God that he's given us. And then watch what he says. When you walk close with the Spirit, here's what's produced in you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against things, such things there is no law. So like, as you're walking with the Spirit, these are the kind of things that are produced in you, right? And what happens is like, as these things are produced in you, you become an incredible blessing to everybody around you. When you're marked by love and compassion like God, people, like, that's a breath of fresh air to those that are around. When you're marked by these things, it's a game changer in your relationships. So think about it. Here, here's the question then. With this in mind, if this is, I think, what God desires to grow in each and every one of us who put our faith in Jesus, if this is the kind of people he wants us to look like, if this is true, then what does somebody who's marked by the fruit of the Spirit actually look like in response to those three relational stressors? Because relationships are messy. Like you're gonna experience, like it doesn't matter if you and your spouse love God or walking with the spirit, you're sinners, you're, there's gonna be some relational stress there that you're gonna have to figure out. So how does somebody who's marked by this actually work through those relational stressors? Let me tell you what it's not. So when you have those unfulfilled expectations, I don't think the fruit of the spirit would lead you to fly off in a rage. I don't think the fruit of the Spirit is gonna lead you to have a cold shoulder and to ice that other person out and to teach them a little lesson. Y'all with me? I know I'm not the only one, just, just walk with me, okay? Just give me a little head nod, I'll know you're with me, all right? Listen, somebody who's marked by the fruit of the Spirit, when there's a lack of communication, the response isn't sarcasm. Come on. <laughs> My wife's amen and probably, she's like, get yourself, I'm trying, you know? 
It's not talking smack, right? Like, like when there really is, like you're getting close to people and you're seeing their weaknesses, their flaws. I think somebody who's marked by the fruit of the spirit, their response is like kindness and forbearance and some graciousness in the midst of that, right? So, Because here's the thing. You're gonna have all this mess in relationships and you need some practical things. Like you, it might be really helpful for you and your wife to sync your calendars on a Sunday night for the week and just to be on the same page. That could really help with communication and expectation. That could be a really helpful thing and you probably should do that. My wife and I share a Google calendar and it's, it's really helpful. I still miss stuff sometimes. She says, it's on the calendar. I said, no, it's not. Then it's there somehow. I don't know, okay? But like, like that could be really helpful. You get a calendar and you share that, right? Some of you, like, there's some relationships that are not healthy, and you might need to put some boundaries up. They're, it's causing a massive amount of stress. It's not healthy. Um, you're really trying to grow, and they're, it's bad. Like, you need some boundaries. That could be really helpful to say yes to things, some no to some things. There might be some relational hurt that you might need to have some hard conversations and work through. Like, you might need to do some of those things. But the reason why I, I'm talking about relational stress like this is very important because if you don't change your heart, you can do steps one, two, and three, but, God, but, but you still have the same cold heart that you had before. So listen, you can sync your calendar with your wife tonight, and then tomorrow morning when the kids don't do what they're supposed to do, you can fly off in a rage and look nothing like God in that moment. That's my temptation. My temptation is to not handle things by the fruit of the Spirit, but to handle things in my own power and to put my thumb down and to, for, like, man, I'm telling you, my flesh can go south real quick. What I need is for God to come in and change my heart. Because if I'm marked by this, if I'm marked by love, compassion, forbearance, graciousness, there's some discipline that probably happens in the morning with my kids. But man, it, it looks different than me flying off a of rage and exploding and using sarcasm and talking smack to my kids. Like, Man, it, it looks a lot different because I'm beginning to look more like the God who's loved me and saved me. And I begin to treat my kids and my wife and those close to me the way God treats me, the way I need to be treated, the way I should be treating other people. And so the question today is this. Man, what is in me that doesn't look like the fruits of the Spirit? And what is in me that God is saying, man, I, I really wanna work on this right now. And if we can maybe work on this and find some healing here, you would see a lot of healing in some of those closest relationships. Not because everything's better, but because you are getting healthier and God's doing a work on you. The more you can look in the mirror and just take extreme ownership and really humble yourself before God, the healthier you tend to be and the healthier your relationships tend to get over a long period of time. Would you bow your heads with me? Um, if you are a Christian, and I know a lot of you in this room are, I would really just begin asking God that, like, like the psalmist said, like, Lord, you search me and you know me. So like, if God knows me, God, help me see the things in my life that don't line up with you. And as God begins to kind of reveal some things to you, man, maybe you begin to pray through that and work through that. But if you're here today and you would say, man, I've never really put my faith in Jesus. I've kind of attended church or maybe trying to be a good person, but I've never really surrendered my life. And that you just know that right now that God's working on you and dealing with you. Man, if you wanna put your faith in Jesus today, you might say something like this, like, God, I know that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself, but Lord, I really do believe that you love me and you died for me, that you rose the third day and that you will return one day. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. Lord, would you use me from this day forward as you see fit? I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, we would love for you to text SAVE to 325-221-3001. Um, it's a way for us to kind of know that you made that decision, but also um, we have a resource that we wanna send you because we want you to continue to grow.